I'm Garrett Quinn Davies, and we're doing creative concepts, and we have two of the most spectacularly joyful individuals that I know. One is the helmsman of our video film series, Barry Average, and one is the helmsman of the Stratford Festival, which is Anthony Chimilino. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. Pleasure to see you both. <laughs> And we've got a film series going now, which we have 12 that we're actually doing for the series. First of all, Anthony, how did it start with you doing the, 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 the canon of the of Shakespeare's canon on film? Well, that began in a conversation with Barry about uh, the fact that we wanted to disseminate the festival's work more broadly and capture these performances by this extraordinary company of Canadian actors. But Gary, you and I talked about it a lot during Cymbeline and it's yeah. something that kept on coming up. I'm gonna hand it over to Barry because what was different in doing this series from everything that had been done before is for the first time, the Stratford Festival, with Barry's assistance and thinking this all through, was in the driver's seat as opposed to having a third party do this. So Barry has been the creative force behind this, but he's also really put together the producing model. And uh, and I'll hand it over to Barry. Well, Anthony, thank you. I mean, I, I this began actually with you and I in a conversation in uh, 2009. Uh, I, I had uh, been watching the Met model very closely on operas and wondered whether or not we can do this. And, and you and I debated the creative merits of doing it. And, and your message from day one, which I loved, was that you never wanted to get a sense that we were leaving out the audience. You didn't want this to be purely filmic. It had to be cinematic, but you had to get a sense of the theater and the audience in the space, or it didn't work. Uh, and so 10 years later, I think 15 productions uh, later, it you know the model works, but it's been your sort of influence in the editing and the shooting to make sure that you get a sense of the room, the theater, the stage, so that you never, forget what Shakespeare intended when he produced and or when he uh, physically wrote his productions as well. So it, it's been a, an amazing journey and it keeps getting better as we perfect, I think, the production and the model and the shooting of these productions. Because they're, they're each production is like Ben-Hur. There's, you know, there's a cast of a thousand, there's effects, there's sound, there's music, there's blocking uh, and incredible choreography. So it, it's, it's not easy, but we're getting there. And Barry, how much conversation do you have with the director of each production before you go into film? And do you watch it a number of times or do you have scouts as well? Well, we go and it's a great question. I mean, we go and look at the production twice and then we have a, a sort of a one camera archival video to look at so we could pick our, our cameras and our blockings and our shots. Remember, unlike the Met uh, uh, or the National, we have one pass at this. It's a high wire app. So we go on, we hope for the best, but there's a lot of planning involved, but we don't have the ability to rehearse the cameras. Uh, most of our cameramen have been with us for the 10 years, so they now get a sense of the production. I have a brilliant editor in George Ralston who is, who is um, uh, a Shakespeare scholar and, is, and understands the nuances of, of editing, which makes it a lot easier for Anthony. He'll always find things about, you know, leave room for the reaction or, we need to get a cutaway to this, or or can you stay a little longer on a line? We've been perfecting that as we're going through, but we don't have the benefit of the Met Opera or the National to to run through this with the cameras and have them know it. So we we spend a lot of time looking at the footage and looking at the shows, talking to the directors and getting a sense of what they want in the film. Uh, they're generally with me in the truck, so you know we have eight or nine cameras, and I'll have the director, and if it's Anthony or if Anthony's a not directing, he's still there because he knows the material backwards and forwards to say, uh oh, watch it, watch it. You know, this character, Timon's coming in, exit stage left. You know, he'll get that sense of whispering in my ear, not always whispering, but to get that sense so that we don't <laughs> lose those, those nuances. Uh, <laughs> getting, getting better to it. Uh, there's a question, Barry, because you have been a follower of Stratford for many, many years, right? Growing up and everything. Didn't you come with your parents yeah, and things? Yeah. First production, Taming of the Shrew, I think I was eight years old. We made the trip. Every summer, I stayed at the uh, Shakespeare Inn with my mother and father and saw production since the age of eight every summer. So, yeah, I mean, it, this has been the blessing. And I owe Anthony, who I've now known since 1996, everything because it's been 360 for me to go to a production from the age of eight, then produce 15 of these. Wow. I could stop now and be very happy. So a question, if you don't mind, I'm going to take us back to two productions that you did 
before this the, uh, this section that we've got of 15 films that Anthony started to do the canon. How uh, was that model different than this model? The ones, and I'm talking about Caesar, Cleopatra, and uh, The Tempest, both uh, with Christopher Plummer in the, in the title roles. The model has gotten better creatively because we, we have the sense of the blocking now and the rhythm and you have the benefit of a decade of working on it. I mean, the model now is uh, a lot more collaboration with the directors, with the artistic director, with the production people uh, like Dave Campbell and, and, and others to sort of make sure that, you know, we really understand it. And along the way, not to be sort of too get into the minutia, but sound. You know, I, I, I really pride ourselves on ensuring, because this is about dialogue and the nuances of Shakespeare's language, and Antony's all over me on this, and making sure that we can hear everything. So we bring in a sound truck and record hundreds of channels of sound, as you know as an actor, uh, that, you know, you're covered in these mics. And when you watch our productions at Cine in Cineplex or on the CBC, uh, the sound is unbelievable. We have a massive truck recording every aspect of sound. You can hear a needle drop, literally, and, and some do drop, but sound is critical. Just to add on to that, uh, we learned a lot over the years. Like, for instance, on the sound front, um, each one of these actors is put into two mics and they have to be yeah. hidden. And we have to still deliver the play at, you know, two o'clock or eight o'clock. So this is a live audience. We prepare extensively to capture that live presentation. And we, we go back time and again in the editing process to make sure that it is refined. I trust Barry's going to get each one of those moments on one of those eight or nine cameras. And, and where we don't capture a moment or something goes wrong, we then in the evening get a chance to look at it again. But what we found that's different, uh, Gare, from years ago, and, and Barry, you may want to comment on this, is there was a, a initially a greater sense of we'll stage this, we'll go back over it, we'll redo this scene. Yes. And what we found over time is the energy is different and consequently, mm -hmm. and somewhat stilted, even though we have an audience there in the evening, that, that live capture is what we go to first. If we need to go back over something, we do it. Um, but it just feels like there's an integrity and wholeness to that one performance that we want to represent in these films. Some of the actors have film experience, some don't. And so Anthony is right that if we had to go back for another take, you, you did lose that energy. So how do we plan for it? So if you look at my shooting script, for example, of a production, you're going to see it covered with numbers and notes, probably not unlike a stage manager's prompt book. But for us, we're really trying to anticipate. And I have somebody in the truck who's in my ear who's telegraphing what's coming up as well. Stand by for this stage right. This character's coming in here. This person's about to drop through a trap. We're all on top of that. And I mean, my God, Merry Wives of Windsor, which you'll see, which is probably one of my favorite out of all of them. The comedy is so great. So how do we capture that in the old sitcom style of multi-camera? Edit it and make sure that the comedy really, really plays. Had so much, so much fun doing that. So in something like Merry Wives, the audience is as big a character as anybody in the play. And how does that affect or get in the way? Does it enhance? Or sometimes does it uh, you know, take over the production? How do you deal with that? I mean, the audience is a character. There's no question. So you, you have to sort of get a sense of, of, luckily, if you have a great audience that day that's reacting uh, and making sure that you can pick that up. We don't do the typical you know, uh, old television, Ed Sullivan style of cutting to the audience laughing. But we want to hear them. We want to hear them reacting. Uh, you know, when, in, the, in the older productions or in shooting, when we used to shoot at at the, the old uh, Tom Patterson where you would be, uh, you know, on a, on a thrust stage, it was uh, tough because sometimes, you know, the audience was there and there'd be a character, I think in King John who brought over, I might be right, brought over a severed head to somebody and you go, uh, uh oh, is that person awake? Are they, do they understand what's happening? So you're really, really seeing the audience, but the audience is very much a character. We're aware of them on that end of it. Uh, and we have to hear them and actually feel them, as do you as an, as an artist. Barry, um, uh, as you said, aesthetically, we wanted to make sure that people know we're in a theater. And right. so, Gare, different productions, like um, uh, the reference to uh, Mary Wives that Barry gave is a good one, because that we had a shameless Falstaff in that. And, um, <laughs> and uh, 
I just wanted to stop you for a second because the reason that we can't do second takes is not only the audience is drunk in the evening, so are the actors. But anyway, yes, carry on. Please. <laughs> but but the work um, was beautifully received that afternoon, and Barry began mm -hmm. the film by actually starting in on the audience so that we know what's going on. I want to say that one of the real challenges Barry and his team faces is that in the cameras being pointed in all all different directions on a thrust stage makes it infinitely harder than capturing a proscenium arch stage where really it's like painting, uh, it's pointing cameras at a painting. Whereas in the thrust, uh, even if you get the shot, which isn't a cinch because there's a lot of characters speaking, like we find the, char the scenes with six characters, like in The Tempest speaking, to be especially hard because we want to have coverage for all of them. So once we even get that done and get it onto the film, we can't disorient the audience. Like in other words, we don't want somebody thinking, where am I on like, where, where was mm -hmm. I in relation to the last shot I had? So that takes balance. There's a similar thing for sound. Just as visually, there has to be a foundation for sound. Um, in the case of a comedy, we allow the room, the theater itself to be a bit more present so that we can sense that people, uh, the actors are performing in a large room with an audience present that's reacting. In the case of Lear, I found that I was working with Barry in the editing uh, process to continue to just moments where we go right in on Lear and we would take out very gently the ambient sound. So we began to become right into his head or Cordelia's right. head. And, and, and all of that feels very intuitive. Nothing, there is this, we, we have eschewed any kind of artsiness. We want the audience to be present in a very visceral way with what's happening on stage. But you know, one thing as, as a player who's been in a, a number of the films that have been shot, when the audience is really engaged that afternoon, you as an actor tend to forget the cameras more. And that has a lot to do with the audience. Because if the audience, particularly in a comedy, is uh, you know, a huge driving force, you're just, you're, you pick up the momentum of their enthusiasm and you take that further forward. And you know, it does make a difference, uh, Anthony, you know, for, for Mary Wives, there was a lot of direct address, Barry. And that is changed based upon whatever waves of hysteria is going on in the house. So for us, it changes our direct focus. So it would probably change what you guys pick up on camera as well. I want to ask yeah. you a question because you play both in a tragedy, Antony and Cleopatra, and also in comedies. Um, do you, I, I don't find people's performances change, but nonetheless, you just talked about the energy being a little bit different. What, do you see any difference in terms of that day when all the cameras come in and you're conscious that, you know, if you screw up, there'll be lots of people recording it? Uh, there's an audience there, but there's also those cameras. Does it feel different? Does it change your performance? I think you feel it certainly at the beginning of the performance, the day it's being filmed with the people who aren't uh, as experienced. There is an attention, a nervousness that uh, kind of is pervading the whole show, but everybody comes on board. And it's amazing how, for me, when I've watched the films, how certain people who haven't had as much experience shine they shine in these productions. So it is a matter of just being more confident uh, and, and people do become confident because they know their roles, you know, 100%. It's just that you do know that there's somebody capturing this forever because you can always lie if it's just live. I think one time, Anthony, we had a, a power failure uh, where we literally had to stop. There was a, uh, uh, the power and strap went off the grid and we had to start again. But for the most part, 15 productions, 10 years has been... Okay. Which production was that, guys? That was Coriolanus, and it was a moment in the film which there's a helicopter that takes off, and Lucy was looking up at it as it was going, and then she goes into this beautiful kind of otherworldly state that Shakespeare gives Volumnia, where she's she's talking about her son and his victories, and the helicopter goes up and the lights all come down. We just had a totally oh, wow. entire city was out. We were, we were looking at each other. And you know, in a way it was terrific because we were able to go back. We were able to do it again. The audience felt very much let in on a, on a secret, secret process. And Lucy just, you know, she said that was great. I just got the nerves right out and we could start over again. Well, there's a question guys about filming Coriolanus. First of all, it's in a pros. And it was a very cinematic production to begin with. How, what sort of challenges or delights did that 
you know, I spoke to uh, Robert Lepage, who I'd had some experience with many years ago on uh, and then on film, and then also on, at the Canadian Opera Company. And I mean, wonderful guy to work with uh, on that end of it. And and I, I nervously had this conversation because again, he had staged it as you said cinematically. So what can I add to it uh, other than ensuring that? it didn't look like we were filming a painting, that we went inside the painting. So I wanted to make sure that he felt comfortable with the close-ups and some of the angles that didn't necessarily give away the magic of these extraordinary projections that he had and, and, and set changes and furniture coming. I mean, a spectacular projection, production. Mm -hmm. So I was very nervous about that and, and ensuring that you know, we, we directed that for film and did not take away from the integrity of what he staged. And at the same time, it didn't look like an archival production that we just shot with, you know, for a couple of cameras. You know, I thought it would be the easy one for me because it's a proscenium stage, no thrust, but it ended up being complex because I wanted to really prove to uh, Lepage and, and, and to Anthony that we could maintain the integrity of shooting a production on a proscenium stage, and especially one as inventive as this. As a stage director, I want to say that Barry's done a fantastic job of preserving the, the sense that you're in a theater, because, you know, you think about it, some things are so easy to do in film, a cutaway, you just go to another place. On stage, that's a shocking, delightful moment when the entire world is transformed and you didn't even notice how that happened. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, the banquet scene arriving in, in uh, the Scottish play, um, Barry was able to preserve both that sense of the surprise and, and also the sense of, of being in a theater as we went through it. And, and that, you know, uh, the cameras, for instance, the technology is so much better now. It's one of the reasons we can do this. But their sensitivity to light is very different from the human eye. Like, I, I, when I look at a stage, I can see all sorts of shades of gray. A camera, basically, like my experience, you can talk more to this, both of you know this world better than I do, you're either not there and then suddenly you're there. Like there's this moment in the lighting where something goes from being invisible to very present. Um, which in a play, like the Scottish play, we worked hard to not see people till suddenly we saw them. Um, in, in, with film, uh, that's actually done quite easily and, and it turns out to be a bit of a challenge because we, there isn't that gradation of gray. Handling that beautifully is what Barry and his team have done so well. I, the interesting thing over the last 10 years has been the evolution of the cameras. And so what you don't necessarily see as the audience is that when we're filming it, in the back of the truck is another 10 technicians who are measuring color levels to make sure that the irises of the lenses open up the right way. We work with your lighting team at Stratford to ensure that, the, that do they have the right lighting for these kind of cameras. We're now capturing in 4K, the next productions that we do will be 8K, so even more detail. And the amazing thing that the audience can now see is the attention to detail of the work that your artisans do in costume and set design, wigs, makeup. You'll, you've never seen this before in the theater. I don't think Shakespeare could have ever imagined getting up that close and seeing the sparkle of costume design. It's really great. So that's been a real plus for us in this evolution. And Barry, in terms of deciding how, like if you're gonna use jib arms or dollies or stuff like that, how do, do you change that per production or has that evolved into something that you know now what you want to do to capture as far as camera placement and things like that? I think in the beginning we brought all the toys in, you know, there, there was, uh, we were, you know, crazy jibs and cranes and dollies and all that kind of stuff. And as we've sort of evolved, I think Anthony has, has really felt, and I've agreed with him, that we really didn't need it. At, you know, at the end of the day, performance was king. So if you're suddenly having a, a you know, a crazy crane oh, shot or a jib yeah. shot in or on that end of it, uh, it really was distracting and took away from the performance at the end of the day. If we really needed it, I mean, in the older days when we were doing this, we'd have a steady cam follow somebody up a climb of a mountain or that kind of stuff or a jump. But, you know, we'd have to do it four or five times. It was expensive and it didn't add much on that end of it. So at the end of the day, if we have our cameras well blocked, we know our blocking of the show uh, and can get the sense of the power of performance, we didn't need all the toys. So we, we stripped that away. Barry, I've been so impressed with the amount of care that goes into 
not just the editing process. I mean, you come in with a game plan after we've talked about what the story's about. You shoot, even though you got nine cameras, you've got a through line that you're thinking about. That's then revised when the editor's looking at all those images for every second of the play and deciding where to go to. I don't think people realize just how much care is put into the end result. There is tons of work. So once all that happens, yes, the sound mixing, then the packaging of the film, the credits, the color, uh, uh, the, the, the delivery to Cineplex, the networks, all of that is a ton of work. So there's literally hundreds of people that, not unlike a major film, but hundreds of people that touch a production to make sure that it looks great. And we've never had one audience member say something's off. You know, uh, uh, it, 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 was, it was great to see uh, the uh, review in the London Guardian this week, uh, for I think it was for Coriolanus that, you know, called it an, an orgiastic production. Uh, okay. I've never had my productions called orgiastic. <laughs> so that's good news. But yeah, a lot to Anthony's point, tons of the process is, is arduous, but I think everybody is really feels that they're working on something special, which was Anthony's original vision to uh, uh, archive these productions forever. How many productions did I see from the age of eight that I will never see because they weren't captured on film? And even from the old days of when CBC used to do it with you guys on that end of it, that's changed. It's just way more cinematic and, and cuts faster and powerful. There is a, a sense of pace that the films have, which we love. What is the audience's response who are actually there the day, I don't mean in terms of laughter, but afterwards, do they feel as if they're getting uh, the, the full value of the production when the cameras are there? Do we know that? We know that they love it because quite often, you know, the large majority of them end up wanting to stay for the pickups where we go back because of technical difficulties or line coverage of covering something a different way or camera coverage, that, you know, to get something we feel that we need it on that end of it. Never, never to enhance performance, but to get coverage. And often the audience, a lot of them stay. They love it. They love seeing the process. Both of you now have spent a great deal of time with each other doing these projects. Have you any interest in directing for the stage? And Anthony, have you any interest in be becoming a film director? I have no interest in, in, uh, in, in directing for the stage. I, I'm too uh, insecure and neurotic in, in that I would be at every performance uh, upset about an audience not reacting to this or, or that, I mean, it's more, it's painful waiting for the reviews on these films and, you know, and, and, and making sure that they understand it. Okay, Anthony? You know, when you're directing, especially on a thrust stage, so much of it is about gently guiding the eye to where you want people to look because, you know, it's three-dimensional and getting them to see something in a certain moment so the actor's in the right place and then just has to speak and it feels effortless is a really, really tough thing. On film, you just point the camera and that's the, the shot you show. So um, I, I find it... Um, I find it a different set of skills. I'm abysmally ignorant about how film go together and anybody who's directed a film hearing what I've just said would go, yeah, you are. Um, so I, I, I love the challenge that comes with everything that gets us to the final uh, product on the stage, which is very different than, you know, I mean, I watch Barry's work and there's a vulnerability to it that is remarkable uh, in his documentaries and in the work that he does. And that, takes a very deft approach because it feels to me like um because the camera's either there or it's not it feels to me like a blunt instrument but i can tell from his work that's not remotely the case there's mm -hmm. a delicacy to it so i think i would be totally inept i will say that from the first one that we did together anthony and i don't know if that was king lear i mean you did say uh that you felt that shakespeare almost wrote for the cinema uh, and, 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 that, and that I've never forgotten that in terms of being in that chair and watching the cameras go by on that end. And, and, and I will say that they're being in, in the truck. I think one of the first ones we did, Anthony invited a couple of our patrons and longtime donors to the festival, the film. And I said to him, are you sure you want that? And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, we'll miss a line. It's screaming. It's yelling in there. It's, oh my God, well, pick up, scrap, pick up, pick up. We didn't get that. Oh, how do we do that? I'm not using language here. But, you know, these people are going to look at this and think that we're complete, you know, vulgar idiots. 
on that end of it. So it is, it is crazy on that end. But Antony almost, you know, makes reference to what Hitchcock's view was, that he found the most boring part of making a film shooting it. He loved the, the prep work of the storyboarding uh, and the rehearsing and working with the actors to get the performance. He felt that once the cameras rolled, sometimes he didn't show up. Quite often he'd let uh, Hitchcock <laughs> and his assistants direct the scenes, uh, many of them. The shower scene in Psycho was, was directed by uh, uh, a, um, uh, the, the art director who did the poster, Saul Bass. So, you know, in the trailers. So, you know, that, that, I, I understand what Anthony uh, is Absolutely. saying on, on that end of it. Gare, on Barry's yeah. point about um, uh, Shakespeare being writing for, the, for film, do you feel as an actor, when you're playing a part like Antony, uh, do you feel that there is a moment where I have to bring the audience into a close-up? And oh, if well, so, how do you go about doing that? You don't have to. Uh, Mr. Shakespeare does it for you. Uh, I find the writing of Shakespeare so, uh, in terms of finding focus and where the focus should go, it is so clear. Uh, and if we as players send that uh, energy to the, the, where it's meant to go also, it, it's not very hard, I don't think, because he's done a lot of the work. It's just like Shakespeare was Hitchcock. He wrote it and then he you know, buggered off and let us all uh, interpret it for ourselves. But it is quite, it's not a concern. It, to me, is very, very clear from the page to translation. But you're an experienced actor who is, knows when to be still, knows to marry movement with words. No, like there's so many things that years of experience gives you, which mm -hmm. on a film can be done for someone. On the stage, uh, you are controlling what we're seeing. Absolutely, but don't forget, we're, we're lucky enough to have some of the finest stages built in the entire world. Uh, and so the thrust stage for me uh, helps you do the focus more than it does maybe on a cross. Because, you know, when you're, when you're like that, it's much more difficult than when you're like this, you know, whatever. Uh, it's just, as you say, your job is to seamlessly guide the audience to us. And if we're doing it uh, orally, then that shouldn't be difficult. I'll also say to that is that, you know, when you talk about the evolution of these productions over the 10 years, uh, that Antony's productions have been ultimately more focused on performance, which has made my life as a, as a camera director of these a lot easier. The earlier productions, there was a lot more uh, trickery and, and, uh, uh, and props and gimmicks and tricks, not that that doesn't enhance a production but it does take the audience away from performance. I think in a lot of ways, Antony's productions have gone back to the page and to the root of what Shakespeare was about, which is getting lost in performance versus uh, sleight of eye. Okay, now we've done 15. We've got how many more to do, 20? Uh, uh, when do we do them? Well, look, we, 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 we began in, uh, help me Barry, we began in 2014. We have 15 productions now. Uh, clearly, this pandemic is putting us on a bit of a pause button, but at the pace of two or three a year, it will take another, you know, five, six years. But it, and that's not a bad thing because it allows us to capture different generations of actors as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comments that I'm seeing in the chat when we do the live streams now are remarkable. I mean, people are um, getting to know this company, this company of of Canadian actors from around the world. There was uh, one comment the other day said, what is this magic? I don't like Shakespeare except in a British accent, but this is wonderful. And mm. so that tells me that um, these films are for s serving an important function of uh, disseminating our work, of conquering both geography and time. And for that, you know, your encouragement and in the early days, Gary, you were really behind me saying, let's get this done. You're bringing the idea to the table, Barry, and then making the model work both artistically and financially. I'm forever in your debt, both of you. Guys, thank you so much for spending your time doing this. Uh, I, think, I think you're right. I think the audiences have really, really appreciated the excellence of what both uh, Barry and you, Anthony, and the other directors and the players and and everybody involved, all the technicians and the craftspeople and the, and the artisans have brought to this series. And I think we're just darned lucky to have both of you uh, to, to help tell these stories but for as many people who can watch them. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
Okay, take care.